Hello, and welcome back to the Guns on Pegs podcast. My name is George Brown, and I'm the editor at Guns on Pegs. I am, as usual, joined by Chris Horn, CEO of ITAP Group. Chris, how's it going? Good, George. It feels like about five minutes ago we were having far too many beers in the pub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't that long ago, was it? <laughs> it was It was about 12 hours, wasn't it? Um, I've, I've, got, I've literally only just got rid of my sore head, and I'm sitting here with another beer, so this is quite... <laughs> kill or cure exactly (laughs) yeah so um chris i've got a little bit of info i just want to share this before we go ahead with the podcast nine months ago or so i hatched some hen's eggs uh, in an Uh, incubator six eggs in the incubator three hatched two were cockerels and then about three months ago the hen got foxed or ferreted or something so i was left with two cockerels So then I went off and bought some new hens. So I've now got six hens and two cockerels. And in order to prevent this lot from getting foxed, because I was getting very fed up with it, I've put them outside my kitchen where I'm recording now, and I can see them through the window. Now, there's two reasons I mention this. One, because I've been getting daily, regular daily visits from up to four cock pheasants who seem very confused about the situation. I think they think they've got a chance with the hens. (laughs) <laughs> and there was one that sat on top of their hen house pretty much all morning, sort of crowing and beating his wings in a very sort of menacing way. But also to say that if you hear a cockerel in the background, that's what it is. And it's going to stay on the recording because it's too annoying to take out. But um, <laughs> yeah, so they, they, they're going to be new permanent podcast features for the rest of time or until I get fed up with them and turn them into soup. I, I thought that was going to turn into one of those mass questions where it's like, I've got six hens and four cockles. How do I move four? <laughs> but I don't know. Do you, do you think that if one of these cock pheasants could make his way into the hen house, do you think he'd try and have his way with the hens? Uh, you'd end up with a f- phantom. I don't think you can say the word, can you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I d- uh, yeah. I, pff, one for our guest in a minute. It must do. I mean, they're all sort of descended from the same thing, aren't they? In one, in a jungle fowl and all that business. But well, exactly. Um, yeah. I'm, it sounds like he's just hungry, George, rather than horny. I think he's horny, if I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you mentioned our guest. Why don't you tell us who's joining us today? So our guest today is the UK Managing Director of the well-known sporting travel company Frontiers Travel, which he's been running since 1993, taking clients, shooting, fishing all over the world, doing lovely things that no one calls work. Uh, In 2015, he produced a sellout book titled A Year on the Moor, which is a photographic account of A Year on a Moor, which took seven years to photograph. He was also part of the great Lem Hill team, which recently won the 2022 gold purdy award and actually his next book living with greys all about wild grey pastures is is based on on that particular estate he also runs the crowsdale summits which are under the banner of of why moorlands matter it's an interesting new initiative that he's pulled together which brings together influential in individuals uh, for open and constructive sharing of experiences and views and particular focus on the uplands and their importance achieving of our shared environmental goals so looking forward to discussing all of that. There's a lot in there. A huge warm welcome to Tarquin Winnington Drake. Thank you, guys. How are you doing? Very well, thanks, Tarquin. It's good to have you with us. Yeah, thank you. I enjoyed the uh, pheasant uh, discussion. What do you think? Yeah, go on. If a cock pheasant got in, what's going to happen? I think he'd have a go, surely, wouldn't he? I mean, it's that time of year. That's why he's there. Does he have any hens around him? No. No, there's been. I've seen one hen pheasant, and she's not been seen again. So I think she's beat a hasty retreat. To be completely honest. Well, that's probably why he's there. Because I mean, <laughs> by this time of year, they should have six or seven around them, shouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. I think he'd get beaten up by the cockerel though if he did get in there. I think he'd find that he regretted it. Probably. Yeah, definitely. But is this where phantoms come from? Mixing the pheasant and the ban- and the bantam must be. I've I've heard about these things. I've never heard of a phantom. Is that a thing? Well, you're going to find out in a few weeks. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, Chris, since you're the most suffering, what's I'm your hangover? I'm not suffering at all. <laughs> my, my, my hangover cure. Yeah, what, what's hang- that you're drinking? I've got something which uh, I did. It's So it's a beer and I did buy it from a supermarket, but it's not commonly available, George. So it's not quite okay. as low as, you, as you've been recently. Uh, but it's called the Thirsty Ferret. Ah, yes. That's cool. 
so quite quite a few of you will know it's from from uh the badger brewers in dorset really lovely i'd encourage it so there's two things about this did you know ferret comes from the latin word for little thief i did not know that are they telling us what the word is? No, I'm going to Google that now. Um, <laughs> so they didn't tell. But on my, I was uh, walking the walking the dog the other day, and I thought I'd, I've never seen a ferret just out walking the dog like you'd see a rabbit. But I saw for the first time a ferret when I was out walking the dog, uh, which I was quite surprised by. And I assume that it would have to have escaped from somewhere at some point. I mean, do these things breed in the wild that much? I don't know. You sure it wasn't a stoat or a weasel? I took a picture and I sent it to a bunch of knowledgeable people. My first thought was polecat, right? Because there's yeah. only mm. only size is the difference, right? But it was a ferret. And then I I thought I went back the next day and I was thinking if I take the little dog box up there and if I can coax it in, that would be. It. But anyway, <laughs> I haven't seen it again. <laughs> I don't oh. think I've ever seen a ferret in the wild. I've seen plenty of stoats and weasels and stuff, but not a ferret. I suppose they do escape though, or get let out. It was in a hole that definitely wasn't his hole. It was it was a hole that was probably a rabbit. So I've got a thirsty ferret, George. Very nice. What are you drinking? Well, after the abuse I received last time, I thought I'd better step it up a bit. And I was going to have a... Well, I've got an old-fashioned. Let's put it like that. Okay. Uh, I was, I was going to just have a normal whiskey, but the sun came out. And I thought, nah, maybe I'll just have something a little bit different with ice. Um, and I found an orange. Um, so uh, <laughs> old-fashioned it is. Tarquin, what's that you're drinking? Well, you guys are going to laugh at me, but a friend of mine, Adam Calvert, once filmed me describing my tea habit. And I have a cup of Darjeeling here with me. Very nice. Because I've actually been to Darjeeling and learned about tea, which is why I really enjoy it. But I don't drink tea with milk or sugar or anything. And the reason why is... I ran the Panoi River Company, um, which is a famous salmon river in Russia, where we can't go at the moment, for 10 years. And at the most miserable time of year, which was sort of late January, early February, we used to have to go into Murmansk via Ivalo on an Aeroflot sort of turbo prop. And um, I always remember that plane for two reasons. When they started the engines, lots of fire would come out of the engines before it actually sort of got going. And and the emergency card on the door, uh, you know, most you know normal planes have emergencies of pulling the window out and all that, you know, putting your life jacket on. This card had a picture of someone climbing onto a, a knotted rope to get out of the aeroplane. Yikes. So we'd have to go in February where it was freezing cold. And in those days, it was pretty grim. The food was quite meager. And so I would, the, pretty much the only thing that would enter my mouth in my three days in my mats negotiating helicopter contracts and stuff was black tea. So consequently, um, and Adam will laugh about this because it's one of his most popular uh, stories on Instagram, is is me explaining my tea habit, which is I have silver needle in the morning, which is a very mild tea, and I have Darjeeling in the afternoon, which <laughs> all the sort of macho shooters around the world just thinks hysterical. So here I am, I'm sticking to who I am, and I've got my cup of tea. Oh, very good. Very nice. And that, loose, and that... loose leaf? Mm. It was loose leaf, but that just got a bit messy. So I'm afraid I've gone to tea bags, but high quality tea bags. Very good. And, and you've got it in a one pint Emma Bridgewater mug. A one pint Emma Bridgewater mug, exactly. We can't get enough of those in our house. <laughs> but I've recently bought some very nice coronation mugs from Emma Bridgewater as well. So. They ran out of one pint mugs for a while, and I had to send them an email, but I've just gone onto their website to check and they're back in. So, <laughs> Have it. Well, do let me know the styles because they're my absolute favorite. Oh, good. Well, at least it's got a story. The Russian situation must be a bit of a pain for you right now. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a pain. And we've gone through various stages of uh, people naturally very upset with what was going on and saying they wouldn't go. And there are plenty of people who are still of that opinion. But the other thing is, you know, a lot of the p people who used to go to Panoi, you know, they they They'd certainly go every year, but many would go twice a year, once in the spring and once in the autumn. Mm. And the staff were like 
very good friends. I mean, we've had some people who've been 50, 60 times. Wow. And, you know, that's that's over a year of their life with these people. Mm. And, and, and the crew of the Panoi, who obviously I'm very fond of as well, that, you know, they're friends, they're not waging war on anyone. So a lot of people are itching to go and you know, trying to think of ways they could go, et cetera, really, because they just want to support the staff. And then the older ones who recognize that that might be it for them, you know, are even more anxious to get back because, you know, when they left the last time, they weren't ready to say goodbye to the place because it, it's, you know, it's an extraordinary fishery. Yeah, it's really tough, isn't it? There must be so many stories of things like this. Yeah, and we all think of the simple stories, which is you can't go and catch a bunch of fish anymore. But there's so much more to it when you actually listen to people who are older, become very attached to the place. Uh, you know, Panoi is a very wild fishery. We we fish 67 kilometers of water. Wow. Which, you know, if you compare that to the spay, 67 kilometers with only 20 rods is one hell of a lot of water. Now, when I go and fish as a guest these days, you know, if I return, I get dropped on the bank and I will literally just fish the bank for miles in in a day and they'll pick me up for lunch or whatever. Um, but equally, we move around the river in these um, low John boats and they're extremely stable platforms for older people. And we've had, you know, plenty of people in their 80s and 90s who couldn't possibly dream of fishing anywhere else. Mm. And therefore, it has extended many a salmon fishing career by a substantial number of years. Yeah. So it, it means a lot to a lot of people. It's awkward, isn't it? Obviously, let's hope it gets itself sorted. But you don't want to be putting money back into the Russian hands too quickly. That's the only <laughs> downside, except <laughs> yeah. for those people. Obviously, they deserve it. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, the, the guy who owns it is an old friend of ours. And he's been a client of ours for many years. And he, he's not waging war on anybody either. Yeah. Anyhow. Um, I'm probably the first person who's produced a cup of tea on the on this podcast. I would imagine. No, no, you're in good company. I think uh, mm. Mr. George Digweed. Oh yeah, was on tea, and I reckon Liam Bell was on tea as well. Oh, uh, was he? Yeah. Well, so go. that might be the third cup of tea. Except <laughs> I don't think any of them was straight black Darjeeling. <laughs> uh, so what was the other one? Silver. Silver needle. Silver needle is where when the tea tea plant. Re refreshes its growth when it starts to regrow the new leaves the brand new leaves they pick them off the top those are the silver needle tea leaves and it's lighter and is it and it's very mild okay and um it's it's a very light color it's a very mild tea it's a great breakfast tea so i'll give it a go Right, so we've all got a drink. It's time to do some listener correspondence. And Tarquin, our first bit of listener correspondence in most episodes is a segment we like to call Whose Bird Is It Anyway? And we invite our listeners to send in their shooting quandaries and queries and dilemmas, and we try to offer advice on how to resolve them. Uh, this one uh, is a query that comes from somebody I'm going to call Cuthbert. And Cuthbert has written, Social media has done wonders for our beloved country sports. It's connected like-minded people and started friendships, but most importantly, it's given us all a chance to share the truly memorable times we all experience in the field. But it has become apparent over the last few years that there are some who just don't know when to put the phone down and concentrate on the job in hand. On a recent late summer partridge shoot in the borders, one individual in the shooting party, who I'll call Rodney, suffers from the ailment of being an insta-spammer. From the minute Rodney arrived at the shoot, even before the peg numbers had been drawn, the camera was out. Rodney was taking multiple pictures, selecting the best one to be filtered and adding the most appropriate hashtags in the hope that one of the big shooting brands would repost it to their page. While the usual introductions to new and potentially lifelong friends are going on, the morning coffee and bacon, bacon rolls are being consumed and the shoot banter commences, Rodney's completely disconnected from the group as he stands off to one side, posting his latest pictures to his stories, almost verging on rude. But who has the balls to ruffle the feathers of the influencer and tell Rodney to put the phone away? 
We stand on the peg and the insta-spamming continues. Rodney's doing his best David Bailey impression, taking pictures of the gun in its slip, the gun out of its slip, the gun on the ground with the slip lying next to it, (laughs) and some strategically placed shotgun cartridges from all different angles. As the drives proceed in the quiet spells, Rodney takes endless selfies, puffing on his obligatory Davidoff cigar with the gun slung over the shoulder to add a bit of humour to the stories. The picture-taking and posting continues throughout the day, into elevenses, then lunch and through to the final drive. The final bag picture is posted, that's all folks, and in time, for, and it's time for home. But don't forget, it's only Wednesday and all this will continue again on Saturday at another shoot in another county. Some may appreciate this is normal on a shoot day and realise that social media has played a huge part in the evolution of shooting as a whole. Some shoots even appreciate the free publicity as it's getting the shoot name out there. For the purist, should the phone, never mind social media, be left in the Range Rover glove box to avoid distractions and really get stuck into the day? To give Rodney his due, he manages to capture some great photos and he'll often send them on for you to keep as a reminder of the day. Now, I'm not trying to contradict myself, but like many, I use social media myself to share some of my shooting excursions and keep in contact with friends, but I'm in no way obsessed with how many likes or reposts my content achieves. So my question is this, phones slash cameras slash social media on shoot days, is there a fine line and how much is too much? (laughs) Wow. We all know someone like this, don't we? (laughs) (laughs) Tarquin, what do you think? Well, um, the first thing that comes to mind is when I did my grouse book, I photographed the great and the good of grouse shooting. And the reason why I was allowed to do it is because they trusted me not to do anything with any image Mm. that I took. So it does make me wonder whether Rodney actually asked people before he just posts them all over the place, because there's many a story of people... Uh, I've actually had staff members who tell me they're ill and um, and then um, their mother or something posts a picture of them at Wimbledon <laughs> or, or whatever. So, um, you know, Rodney could get certain people into all sorts of trouble by, by posting them. So my one piece of advice to him is perhaps he should ask all his his new friends whether they mind being plastered all over social media. And I think the same goes for shoots. I think a lot of shoots uh, may like it, but I think an equal number do not like it at all uh, would be my guess. Uh, God, uh, just thinking about it, I mean, Rodney should probably decide whether he wants to be a photographer or a, or a, or a shooter. <laughs> That's a good point. Because he'll, you know, he'll definitely do do them both. Whichever he decides, he'll probably be better at it if he does one or the other, would be my guess. <laughs> He, he could just go to all these shoots, take photos, and then pretend he was there if that's what his his objective <laughs> is for his, for, for his father. And he'd as be well. a lot wealthier. Exactly. He'd, he'd be a lot. He'd have a lot more money at the end of it. With modern photo editing software, you probably don't even have to go. You just uh, green screen it. <laughs> I think the point where uh, our our who did you call him? What do you call him? Cuthbert. Yeah, Cuthbert, the point yeah. where Cuthbert says uh, verging on rude, I think, is the point here. Um, there's a phones on a shoot day for me are a, like I wouldn't say they're quite what it used to be when it was like an absolute no no. When I grew up shooting and I went to Chippenham Park in Cambridgeshire and Eustace Crawley said, if I see that phone on a shoot day, I don't think he said he'd shoot it, but you'd definitely be sent home. Um, and it was that sort of environment. Now they're slightly slightly different to that now. I think getting the phone out just like in a very discreet way is okay but i think this is this is a problem for me this really bothers me i i I agree yeah i mean i never even think of taking i it's not something i think of doing i'm too busy worrying about whether i'm enjoying yourself yeah i'm too busy sort of drinking it in and then afterwards i think oh shit i never took any photos today yeah because i do think it's nice to have pictures and i do think it's you know it's i don't have a problem with people posting on social media either Maybe we should ask Cuthbert if Rodney's found his number of invites is declining, because <laughs> that might be a good in- indicator for him on, on this. <laughs> but it's interesting. The, the, the point about social media being a, a force for good in field sports, I mean, it's potentially debatable as to whether that's true for shooting, but it's definitely true for fishing, I think. I think fishing is a lot more visible 
these days. And I think it was that's also come with one or two downsides, hasn't it? You shared a, a piece, Tarquin, on um, on Scribehound a couple of months ago about fish handling and uh, catch and release. Yes. And I think that possibly wanting a picture for Instagram is responsible for some of the less brilliant practices. That's a good point. Yeah, that is a good point. And people probably hold on to the fish too long, mess about with it too long, etc. cetera, to, to do that. I, I agree with you. I, I tell you what I'm not a brilliant fan of for shooting sort of social media is sort of helicopters flying in and all of that i just i just don't think that's a brilliant message yeah i i think this rodney standing on the peg puffing the cigar taking the yeah. selfie on the on the start of the drive like honestly could you paint us in more of an obnoxious light i mean <laughs> i mean if he was posting yellow hammers and and linnets and and the new hedge project that the shoot had done yeah that would be a that would be a much better thing to post than exactly. puffing on a cigar <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like it's getting worse than it used to be and i think yeah I don't know. I'd love to see shoots more outspoken like they used to be on this. But because everyone is, there's more and more sort of payment going on. And, you know, I just think that people are too nervous about saying the wrong thing. What? So you think shoots are frightened of laying the law down with, with people? Definitely. Yeah, I'd love to see more thrones being thrown in the air and shot out the sky. That would make my day. Yeah. <laughs> I shall remember that next time we're shooting together, Chris. <laughs> I, I said it was okay if you were doing it in a very discreet way. You know, take yourself around the side during 11s, is, respond to an urgent email if you have to. But this sort of thing is the bit that pisses yeah. me off. <laughs> and I mean, I'm being serious. I, I, I think you do need to ask people before you start posting them yeah. on social media because that can really upset people. Not necessarily because they're doing something wrong, but you know, some people are very sensitive to it. Yeah. Yeah, chat, if someone if if a chap brings along a lady, you never know if it's his wife or not, and you've got to be careful. That too. <laughs> <laughs> Jeepers. Yeah. <laughs> right, Chris, I think we've solved that one. Uh have we got an unpopular opinion this time? Well, this week we've got an interesting piece of correspondence from a rather disgruntled listener who we shall name Hugo. Uh, it's not an unpopular opinion as such, but it needs to be heard. Um, so before I start, this relates to someone who featured on our 50th episode. And if you haven't heard that yet, don't worry, all will become clear. So he says, hi, guys, I'm writing in response to the 50 not out episode. The whose bird is it anyway? The one where my own uncle, my own flesh and blood, a man I've spent countless days in the field with, threw me under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I would just like to say that this is purely meant in good sport. I've shot with, not at, my uncle on a couple of days last season, invited by my grandfather at said shoot in Wiltshire, when I've been able to make the supposedly impossible two and a half hour journey from Cornwall. We've all had a laugh in the pub over this subject post shoot days, but I'd like to take the opportunity to tell my side of the story. My uncle, who grew up in Wiltshire like me, also now lives two plus hours away from the shoot itself. And also, like me, uses the brilliant invention of motorways and main roads to get to places on a Friday evening in order to start a shooting weekend. I started beating at this syndicate from the young age of seven, shot my first pheasant at 14 and spent my school holidays helping out my grandfather with various jobs which are necessary to make a good shoot. Now aged 32, over the years, I've even helped with the arrival of pheasant poults the day before my own wedding but I still seem to be on the waiting list for my own family syndicate place. So you can imagine my uproar when a local farmer with a shiny tractor is suddenly the flavour of the shoot. <laughs> I see that my uncle tried to soften the blow with the fact that we went to Scotland last October after the Red Stags. According to his story, my uncle, in his own words, took me to Scotland, but it was more I met him there after an 11-hour drive up from Cornwall a drive which more than qualifies me to make it to Wiltshire every other Saturday of the season. <laughs> the icing on the cake, which my uncle failed to mention, <laughs> is that the shoot is actually hosted in a barn next to where my parents live. <laughs> <laughs> my parents, I'd like to point out, don't shoot, but are definitely players on the shoot day. As it's whose bird is it anyway, I'd just like to ask the question whether my ranting is justified and I have a case at all for whenever a syndicate place becomes available again, 
or if I should just accept that my place in the family syndicate will be as elusive as a white pheasant. <laughs> oh, I love this. I love that people are using the podcast to, as a sort of family mediation service. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this begs the question, is his uncle being honest about the reasons for not having him on the syndicate? Uh, yeah, Ooh, good point. Crikey. <laughs> but but aren't family members, you know, if you've got an embarrassing situation, the family member is always the one that gets it because then it's not as, as difficult to deal with as That's somebody true. else. Yeah, my that... suspicion is that this tractor is quite important for the continuation of the shoot. That's, my, that's <laughs> well, what I that reckon. Too. It probably doesn't happen if they haven't got the tractor to pull the beater's wagon. Yeah, Tarkin, I think you're right, actually. There's nothing sinister in this. It's just that it's too awkward not to let this guy, new guy on the syndicate. Yeah. And and nephew's just taken the cop. And you always just think, well, I'll invite him or I'll do, we'll take him to Scotland or I'll do something else with him. We need the tractor. We need the farmer. And, it, you know, the jobs are good, isn't it? He didn't realise <laughs> that by doing that, it would enter this sort of public sphere of debate. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably regretting it now. <laughs> But it, I mean, there's also another aspect here, which is obviously this chap's uncle sent us this quandary. And as a result of having his story and his, his, his email read out, he got some garters. But it turns out he might not have been entirely truthful in the story that he sent us. So the question I have is, is it possible for, can we rescind garters? <laughs> <laughs> Can we make the uncle give them to to the nephew? So, yeah, you're right. He earned his garters for cutting his nephew out of the syndicate. Yeah. It's not right, is it? <laughs> I think I think this is what should happen. I think the nephew should should be given the garters. I think that's the Ooh. that's the solution. I mean, Good idea. the nephew could also borrow a big silver tractor and turn up on a shoot day <laughs> with an enormous tractor and see if that improved his chances. Yeah, he could maybe speak to Jeremy Clarkson and get his Lamborghini. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Borrow, borrow the Lamborghini. <laughs> uh, George, I think you're onto something. I think we should leave it to the syndicate to discuss uh, as to where these garters should end up and maybe if there's any other fine they'd like to put in place. Yes, I like that. And maybe if Big Shiny Tractor Man would like to get in touch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tell us yes. just how big Tell his us. tractor is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and how awkward he now feels that he's the sort of subject of this. <laughs> maybe he borrowed the tractor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God, after all that, turns out it was all for show. Just to get himself on the syndicate. He did a better job. Tarquin, have you ever had someone want to join a syndicate or a fishing trip or a shoot day and you've just really not wanted them there but you haven't given them the 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 full reasoning behind why they can't come uh yes but it's generally not me it's usually somebody else which makes it even more awkward because in fact i had an incident yesterday where i was f forming a group to go somewhere and it was all forming nicely until one of them was rude about Arsenal. And then I got a message from one of the others going, if he's coming, I'm not. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so it's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? That seems to me to be taking football a bit too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> and, but, and also being rude but, about Arsenal at the moment, it's very easy. They've basically just <laughs> given away the title. So that was entirely. Well, founded. they have. They have. <laughs> Yeah, it can be awkward, and they always expect you to deal with it. They never deal with it themselves. You've got to make up a different story, basically. Yeah, I mean, the politics of syndicates and um, fishing parties and, and all the rest of it, they're always interesting. I, it's funny, isn't it, because they always say syndicates always fall apart eventually. And I think the best ones are the ones that sort of evolve over time, aren't they? Maybe someone storms off in a huff and you just get someone nicer in <laughs> i don't envy your job tarquin of sort of having it if that's sort of the you're almost not quite your usp but you know forming these teams and making yeah. sure it all works smoothly. being diplomatic with everybody is quite tricky sometimes do you sometimes feel like nanny <laughs> uh yes i i once had a he, he's no longer with us but i had a a guy who was a seriously keen shot he was he was with us in Russia. Lovely, lovely, lovely guy, but very tricky and took being tricky as a sport. 
it was is one of his favorite things to do was just be annoying and tricky. Oh no. And I don't um, know anyone like that, Chris, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you pointing the finger at? <laughs> we would always examine the weather before Saturday when we used to fly people out on the chopper. And if we thought it was too bad in the morning and that people miss, miss their flight home, we would f- we would get them off the river, put them on the chopper on a Friday night, put them up in a hotel, and then they would definitely make their flight home because uh, people hated missing their flight home because it did become a complete nightmare. But, you know, we are contracted for people to stay in the camp for seven nights and therefore the guests have the right to elect not to do that. So I did my usual speech of this is the plan unless anybody has any objections. And this guy stood up uh, amongst 20 people in the camp and said, well, yeah, you know, I, I object. I want to stay and fish. And I was like, oh, God damn it. You know, what am I going to do? So then I went, okay, well, that's what we'll do. We'll, we'll all stay. And, you know, as long as everybody realizes that we may not get out with the weather. So that's fine. We'll stay. And I walked away. And all all other 19 people sort of leapt on this guy <laughs> and just attacked him. And the decision got reversed. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a good so. way of handling that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did a good job. Right. So Cuthbert and Hugo, uh, and of course now you, Tarquin, are all fully signed up members of the most noble order of the garters and will shortly be in receipt of their very own set of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters. That would be an honour. If you too have got a shooting confession, a quandary or a query that you'd like us and our guests to help you with, or if you've got an unpopular opinion, or if you'd like to tell us about a forgotten drive for our new feature uh, and you'd like a set of garters, drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com. So, you know, last week, George, I said, can someone help us help me with the garters because I'm crap at sending them out on time? Uh, Yes. Yeah. Well, we've had the biggest hero of all heroes come forward uh, off the back of the last episode saying, I will take on the role of being garter sender outer, uh, which I now feel awful for even sharing. (laughs) (laughs) Um, so we're going to have to look after this guy in a bunch of different ways. So I'm going to put it out there again. If anyone else well wants to look out, look after the podcast Garter Sender Outer with anything, they- <laughs> hang on, wait. Are you outsourcing rewarding people who are trying to help us by outsourcing? I think that's a bit strong. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, George, you don't ask, you don't get. Okay. <laughs> anyway, this guy is an absolute hero. Of course, we're going to do all sorts of things for him. I don't know, drinking competitions at the podcast party, something like that. We'll see. But um, thank you very much to him for coming forward. He knows who he is. Yeah, very, very. Oh, that's amazing, actually. It never ceases to amaze me how far the lengths that people will go to for this podcast. And it just goes to show that um, we've accidentally created something very cool. Uh, yeah. So thank you to the person in question. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, very good. So Tarquin, back to you. Uh, I was enjoying hearing that last story. So, so, so tell us. So Frontiers, I mentioned at the start, 1993. That's a long time ago now, in the grand scheme of things, and the way that our world has come on in shooting and fishing. Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, and and the sort of parent office in the US was 1969. Goodness, um, Mike and Susie Fitzgerald. He was a dentist. She was a school teacher. They used to go on trips. They were always a disaster, so they decided they could do it better. And, I mean, they discovered, you know, Argentina dove shooting, Christmas Island bone fishing. They uh, they were part of the first lodge fishing for sea trout in Tierra del Fuego. I mean, th- there's a long history of discoveries by f- Frontiers over the years. George, rank your top three of the, those three in order then. So we had, wait, bone fishing in Christmas Island, Tierra del Fuego um, sea trout, sea and trout, doves in Argentina. Argentina. Well, I mean, Tierra del Fuego's top. Yeah. And if I could tie that in with some dove shooting, that would be great. <laughs> Easily done. <laughs> Easily done. I mean, we, we could do a guns on 
on Peg's podcast from the dove fields of Argentina. Now we're oh. talking. <laughs> Life just got cool. <laughs> we're not very good at recording on location, though. It tends to go yeah. wrong. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that stumps the 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 garter guy. <laughs> but the problem is, he'd have to be there. <laughs> <laughs> when I started, we didn't have computers. We didn't have faxes. We t- we typed letters on typewriters and posted them out. Uh, people didn't know there were sea trout in South America. They didn't know what a bonefish was. And so we would do, we used to have a slide projector in the office and people used to come in and look at slides of where they might go and what a bonefish was and, you know, the etc. and decide to go on these trips. And um, that's, that's how it all started. But, but travel was also... The Americans were so sophisticated with their pre-trip information, which is was of the highest quality. So it was quite easy to do well because with them and their material and the novelty of of what we were encouraging people to do, we we built it up quite quickly because we did a really good job. That's mad. We're not a sporting agent. We're a travel agent. And therefore, compared to many of our competitors, we get the travel right. Mm-hmm. And sporting agents don't have that core travel basis and therefore tend not to get the travel right. And, you know, when I talk about travel, I'm talking about meet and greets in weird places and people looking after you yeah. goes wrong and all the rest of it. And time and time again, when it used to go wrong in Russia or other places, we'd always come out on, on top because of our travel pedigree rather than our mm. sporting agent which is why we don't really let shooting in this country other to, other than to foreigners, because we're helping them travel. Yeah, yes. uh, it makes sense. I mean, that travel thing is interesting because my dad tells a story about um, he went to Russia to shoot Driven Boar. And he was there, it, uh, well, it was basically as the Berlin Wall was coming down, um, was when they were supposed to be traveling back. And the whole thing, the, all the travel arrangements just completely went to shit. And um, he says they were walking around, they they went to the information desk in in Moscow airport and they put every credit card they had between them on the desk and said, get us into Europe. Don't care where. And then they ended up walking around Charles de Gaulle airport armed to the teeth and nobody batting an eyelid. They they ended up in Paris and and they they got home two days later. But that travel side of things, especially when there's firearms involved and Mm -hmm. all that stuff, you know, knowing that somebody's sort of got a handle on what's going on and is there yeah. at the end of the phone if you need them and something does go wrong um, must make an enormous difference. Yeah, it does. It, it does. So Tarkin, do you sort you sort out all the permits, stuff like that? Do you sort out transportation of guns and things? I mean, if necessary, yeah. It, I mean, traveling with guns is becoming more and more of a nightmare. People therefore are electing to do it less and less. And, you know, locations are getting themselves organized to supply people with guns because yeah you know airlines make it as difficult as possible and they also change the rules on a whim which makes it much more difficult i mean when my dad was running purdy uh they were doing one of the shows in vegas and they got to vegas and then all of the purdy guns turned up on the luggage carousel just for for anyone it's it's crazy (laughs) it's crazy i mean uh, I remember going to Spain and everything was fine, but you know, British Airways and Iberia have a code share and therefore you may book with British Airways, but you could end up on Iberia equipment. So when we checked in, it was all fine, but then there was a change of aircraft because there was a mechanical on the British Airways metal, as they call it, And then they were going to use Iberia metal. And suddenly it all went to hell because the guns couldn't go on Iberia metal, whereas they could go on. I mean, oh, God, it's crazy. Uh, Crazy. How frustrating. Yeah. So where do you find yourself most? Which countries? Well, I used to find myself in Russia a lot. I now probably spend most time in Iceland. I'll spend most of July in Iceland. It's a tough life, isn't it? (laughs) I was about to say. (laughs) can't get away with comments like that can you really the the, but i mean i I own a car in iceland because (laughs) the cost of renting a car is so enormous it's better to buy one 
if you rent a car in Iceland, just don't buy one because <laughs> you can use it for a month and then sell it probably for what you bought it for. And it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> That's very good. Amazing. No, I mean, so, I mean, I don't want to give the impression that, you know, traveling for shooting or fishing is nothing but disasters, but I do want to know the biggest disasters because I think that that's always a fun story. So <laughs> what? When, give us an example of when something's gone really horribly wrong. I mean, I mean, lots of, lots of things go wrong and then, and it's how you react to them. But I think, uh, I mean, this is a really bad story. You, you've assured me I'm okay to tell bad stories. Can you just reconfirm? Yeah, that? absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> okay. We can we can we can always edit it out once you've told it if it turns out to be too far. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Or you can put beeps in or whatever. But oh yeah, I'll get my pheasant sound out. <laughs> or, or your cockerel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we're in Russia. It's pretty intense. We used to do 18 weeks straight. We'd go in for two weeks and we'd have to dig our way down into the camp through the snow, build the camp while the snow was melting and and so on. And then it's you're, you're off to the races, 18 weeks straight, in, out, in, out. And they, you, your guests would leave at about eight o'clock on Saturday morning and the next group would land about three o'clock on Saturday afternoon. Mm. So you had that amount of time to, to make the camp look like new. Anyhow, the helicopter lands and these uh, ashen-faced Americans get out of the helicopter just white as sheets. And and I I immediately knew something was wrong. And so I'm like, what's wrong? And they're like, the Irish. And I'm like, well, what about the Irish? And they said, well, they were drunk when they got on the helicopter and they were throwing vegetables around the helicopter (laughs) <laughs> and you know hitting the pilot on the back of the head with carrots and cabbages oh and god. stuff oh my god and they were just completely out of control and you've got to rein them in and you've got to do something about it blah 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 and i'm like okay god so you know we got everybody out and sure enough they were very drunk um but we got them to their tents and i, I thought right well, well we'll see how 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 things evolve you know we're not nobody's getting on a helicopter for a week so Anyhow, so um, dinner arrives and one of the the drunk Irish is on my table. And at at, at those times, there were tables of six. And he was, you know, drunk enough that his eyes are rolling and his head's rolling around and he's not really engaged. You know, from time to time, he'd get involved in the conversation. But equally on my table is you know, one of my biggest cheeses in life in terms of clients, you know, very upstanding, very proper, you know, uh, as proper as it gets. And we're chatting away, trying to just sort of ignore this guy. And he suddenly looks at my other client and he goes, was that your wife who dropped you off at the airport? And uh, he goes, well, actually, no, it was my girlfriend. And he goes, oh, because I really like to f- her up this. Jesus, I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> how, how do we do it? What do you do now? I mean, I thought he'd just stand up and put his lights out, but he didn't. He was calm. It was fine. The Irish guy fell asleep at the table. And 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 everything was okay. And and the next morning, I had to take them aside and say, look, look, you know, you, th- this just cannot carry on. You know, and if you carry on, I'm going to have to put you on a chopper out of here. And by the way, it's you know, twenty six k to get you out of here, and it'll be your bill if I have to put you on a chopper out of here. But that was the most embarrassing. Oh my goodness! Situation of my life. Oh my god! In gosh. terms of clients, I, <laughs> I just, I just did not see it coming. How did the other guy deal with this? He, he never spoke about it. We've never spoken about it. I mean, he was brilliant, but it was an absolute shocker. But you know, but the, the, those, those Irish guys, you know, when they're just normal drunk instead of too drunk, they're wonderful, and, and the, the crew love them. 
and you know another time they were they were out and one of my one of the russian guides was was called misha and he had very high cheekbones and he had wrap around glasses and they nicknamed him he did look like a special agent so they nicknamed <laughs> nick, nicknamed him uh, agent timoshenko because he <laughs> he did look like a, 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 a you know an agent anyhow they're on the radio and suddenly they come on emergency emergency please come to the dock immediately emergency emergency and uh, as a camp we we did all these safety plans so when there was an emergency, everybody had a job. Everybody knew what their role was. People would go here. People would go to the phone, ready to pass messages back to Mamansk, et cetera, et cetera. So the camp goes into this sort of overdrive ready. And um, we were sort of jumping on the vehicles to drive down to the dock. And I actually thought, well, um, I better ask what the problem is. So I said, well, we're on our way. What is the problem? And they go, Agent Timoshenko's forgotten the gin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> this is on the same trip. Or, I mean, they came so many years. I can't oh, really? Remember. I, they, they're testing your patience, aren't they? I mean, they, they were legends. I mean, you know, another time I remember I was out guiding and I used to come back at lunchtime just to make sure everything was okay. And there's this massive boom, boom, boom coming. And I'm thinking, what is going on? And and the Irish have come off the river early. They've gathered all the, the, the crew who aren't guiding and they're having a disco <laughs> in, in the middle of the day. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there are so many stories. But, yeah. Amazing. I mean, that's amazing. You're definitely going to see it all. It's it's different. It's different to sitting behind a desk, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. And you know, at the end of the day, we're glorified travel agents. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're you're going to take a picture of a lion or going to look at the Leaning Tower of Pisa, whatever. You're a glorified travel agent, and what matters to people is your detail and your information and mm. and and how you look after people. So the end product is almost, you know, what you've got to do is get your attention to detail right that that's it but there is this very upside of dealing with a lot of wonderful wonderful clients mm. um and i guess the other thing about it must be that you're you are facilitating these experiences for your clients that they will be talking about in a similar way to the way you're talking about it now they will be forming memories that will be you know core memories generating these experiences for them that will be among the the happiest and best experiences in their life. And that's got to be very rewarding. I think too many people can be a bit stuck up about their fishing and shooting and not let their hair down and not appreciate it the way you've described. But those that, that give of themselves, you are... And 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 you are you are making lifetime memories absolutely. And and I hear about them, and there are old clients who are in touch with me to this day that I've had incredible times with. There was one guy who we were very very fond of, who was an absolute legend. He got the license. He was South African originally, and someone had told him, you know, if you sleep with the British ambassador's wife, he lived in Angola. And he had the license. He had the license to make Levi jeans for the whole of Africa. Wow. And he used to say to me, "Darwin, Darwin, it wasn't a business; it was a license to print money." <laughs> <laughs> and 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 so, <laughs> while he was living in Angola, somebody told him, "Look, if you sleep with the British ambassador's wife, you'll get a, a UK passport." So sure enough, he did that. <laughs> he got his passport, and then the. The war comes to Angola. He's driving in his Range Rover, and most people have left. He he was basically losing everything, and he got stopped by some guys with an AK-47. They they lent in to take the keys of his car, and he was like, hold on a minute. If they get the keys of the car, I'm in deep trouble. So he just floors it away from them in his Range Rover, and they drill the car with an AK-47, and they get him in the back. Oh, my God. And um, all the doctors had gone. So so he goes to the vet, and the vet pulls the bullet out of his back. 
and he decides it's time to leave. And as he said to me, I left with nothing but the shirt on my back. So he, he lost all his cars, all his bank accounts, his factories, his fishing boats, everything went. And he ended up in the south of France. He's sitting on the beach and this woman next to him asks him to put sun cream on her back. And uh, he, 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 he was a very funny guy, but he could be an absolute gentleman. And so he puts cream on this, this, this lady's back and they get chatting and he tells his story about how he used to be in the rag trade. And she's like, well, you, you, must, you, you know, must meet my husband. He's in the same, same business. So they meet and they become friends and they become business partners and they become CNA's largest supplier of underwear and white goods. <laughs> and he completely remakes his fortune wow. as a result. Oh and, and became a great legendary client of mine for many years, fishing and shooting and all sorts of stuff. Goodness me. And and I mean there are so many examples of people like that. And I remember he got he got bowel cancer and I went up to see him and, and nothing had ever defeated him in life. But I remember him taking me by the hand, he said, I, I can't beat this one. I can't beat this one. And I, I will just never forget this extraordinarily determined, upbeat individual who was finally defeated. Oh, my so, goodness. goodness me. Yeah. There's a lot of people like that. Yeah. Good, good people. So so destinations, I, I want to know. So we've mentioned Iceland and Russia. Where else? I mean, you've, you've mentioned a few more. What other ones are top of the list? I think Seychelles is high on the list from a fishing point of view. Mm. Um, I think... Argentina, from a shooting point of view, so that the, the rock pigeons in South Africa are becoming ever more popular. I was about to say, I've heard a lot more people talking about that. Very, very sporty. The closest thing I've seen to driven grouse. Really? Without a doubt. And I think Spain. Spain is becoming really good value because, you know, it, when, when, when Frontiers started doing Spain in the 70s, it was Frontiers having to piece everybody together and the meet and greet, and then mm. they'd bring somebody in to do the gun import, and et cetera. Now, if you buy a trip to Spain, you, other than tipping your secretary and your loader in the house, you don't put your hand in your pocket. You just land with or without your guns, and and there's people to meet you. They take you there. Everything's included. And it's becoming really good value. It's becoming good value. I've said it on this podcast several, several times that Spain is top of my list of things that I'd like to go and shoot partridges in Spain. I'd love yeah. to go and do it. And one of the things that I think is interesting is, um, you know, if you are living in the southeast of England, which a significant proportion of people do, obviously, then getting to Madrid is probably easier than getting to Yorkshire. <laughs> yeah, practically. <laughs> About the yeah. same amount of time, isn't it? But so I also think that, you know, with all these destinations, I, I remember talking to Horacio, who, who runs the, the dove shooting in Argentina, and, and, and he's like, you know, all the Brits turn up and go, I want to shoot, shoot them like driven grouse. I want to be in the valley to shoot them as high pheasants. I want to do this. I want to do that. And it's the same with Spain. In, and he's like, why don't, you know, they're coming to Argentina. Why not come and shoot Argentine doves? Mm, yeah, yeah, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Instead of this sort of approach that you want to bring England to where you're going, why not go <laughs> and enjoy whatever you're doing for what it is? It's the shooting equivalent of demanding ham, egg and chips when you go on holiday to <laughs> yeah. Spain, isn't it? it, it... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> instead of a paella. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and Spain's a bit like that in that you know a lot of people want to go to Spain and shoot the highest possible birds, but I mean you can do that in this country. You know, there's a completely different mentality. Spain, you know, the way of the, the way the Spanish shoot, admittedly, is probably more expensive because you shoot more. But for the Spaniards, it's a test of shoot, of accuracy at speed. Here we're te we're trying to test people's accuracy. There they're trying to test people's accuracy at speed. It, Different things. So it might be worth just going into a little bit of detail about how the Spanish style of driven shooting differs from the English style of driven shooting in terms of the way the birds are presented. And okay, let's take your wealthy Spaniard who's coming to shoot. The first thing you'll notice is instead of 
A loader and A secretario, there's going to be two loaders and, and a secretary. So his team is bigger than your team. And they're not carrying a pair of guns. They're carrying six guns. What? And, and wow. the reason why they're carrying six guns is, you know, it all makes perfect sense. But you've got two loaders and, you, and therefore you're using three guns, not two. And part of this is, is because of the speed. And part of it is because it's warmer. Therefore, the guns get hotter yes. quicker. And, and so you've got your two loaders, one, one to the left, one to the right. You've got the secretary behind you and you're working three guns. And then at some point, those three guns are going to get too hot. So they put those down and pick up the other three and carry on. That's why they show up with six guns. Wow. It's quite a big game to enter when you need six to show up, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it is. And so how, how are they present? I've always, I, I've done a bit of reading, but I've never experienced it. But um, I've always understood that they are presented, uh, that they drive the birds uh, not for height, but for almost like a sort of a bit, maybe a bit like the way gray partridges are presented. Yeah, it's a sort of, it's a, it's like a, a mix of gray partridges and grouse. And, you know, if they do it well, you're not, you don't have much time. You're not seeing them coming. And that's where the, the element of speed or part of the element of speed coming. You don't see them. You see them for an instant and they come thick and fast. So it's kind of quite instinctive shooting. Exactly. Whereas, and, 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 you know, shoots like Ventasia and others, you know, they develop their shoot. Now they've got some high drives and, and, and sometimes, you know, a traditional Spanish partridge shoot will have higher drives, but you'll st- still not see the birds for very long. Mm. And they won't be massive towering, you know, hugely high birds, which, you know, some Spanish shoots have devo- evolved that because that's what certain parts of the English market want. But I actually prefer to go and shoot like the Spaniards do because then I'm having a different experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the pace of the day is so, you know, they don't, they don't struggle for daylight. So you wander out at like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. You would do a drive and you sit down and have taco and chat and then you go and do another drive. There's no rush at all. That's very Spanish, isn't it? And there's plenty of birds and it's usually nice weather. And I like the atmosphere, lots of shouting of the secretario and, you know, double and all this sort of business going on. Everybody's having a having fun and they just perhaps take it a little less seriously than we do. That's interesting. Yeah, that's cool. And so what are prices looking like at the moment? Obviously, prices have gone up a lot over here. I mean, they, their prices must have gone up a bit, but they release in different ways. So, yeah, I think I think it's fair to say the way they release is a mystery. <laughs> Let's call it that. I mean, off the top of my head, I don't have prices here, but you know, a six hundred bird day. You know, the, and some some of the shoots in Spain have moved it up to they want you to shoot eight hundred, which I'm not sure I agree with. But a six hundred is sixty two euros a bird. But for that, you're getting your gun import taken care of. You're getting your transfers t- taken care of. The massage services included. All the drinks are included. You can bring your non-shooting partner. You're just not being nickel and dimed anywhere along the way. So that price is basically, that's all inclusive, effectively. That's all inclusive. So that includes accommodation? In co- accommodation, cartridges, gun loan, you name it. It's included. That's, that's pretty phenomenal, good value, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because I think, well, 62 euros. So, well, the average last year was 54 plus fat, which is more expensive. So obviously you still got to travel eight to a point. You've definitely got accommodation on top, got your ammo, this, that and the other. It's quite attractive. And the tips are different. I mean, you know, you give your secretary 75 euros. Yeah. And if you're on a big day in the UK, your tips are now getting bigger and bigger. They are getting bigger. <laughs> Yeah, goodness me. Well, it's it's why it's getting more exp- more more popular. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, it's becoming good value. So coming back to the other side of what we mentioned at the start, the books and the conservation stuff. 
a year on the moor and then also now living with greys tell us a little bit about that because i follow you on instagram and by the way i yellow hammers are like <laughs> i've i've been doing anything i can to get yellow hammers at home and i see them out on my dog walk just a couple of fields away yeah. and and when i see them i get so excited and i just really and I, you post some amazing photos of yellow hammers and stuff like that obviously you're getting a lot of con, you know documenting a lot of the wildlife T- tell us a bit about this well i mean the the, the grouse thing came about you know I, I thought it was fun taking pictures and then I had a bit of success and you know really through encouragement of the guy who owned the moor which is where I spent most most of the time and then he asked me to start hosting his days when he wasn't there so then I ended up spending you know 20 25 days up there you know when you spend that amount of time you get to understand the community and what makes them tick. And, you know, there is unquestionably this symbiotic relationship between those communities and the grouse in that the grouse, you know, they may or may not survive completely unmanaged, but certainly any any number of them will not do well without human management and care and things like predator control, etc. But equally, you won't find too many people in a grouse community who don't know what the weather forecast is in, in May. Huh. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty... And, and, you know, where I was, those keepers were getting... You know, when I'd want to go and photograph Curlew, they'd like, come, okay, come up with me in the morning. And, I, you know, I thought I might cruise up there at 7 o'clock. I was, they were going up at 4.30 in the morning and they would sit on their beat on a rock and they would just, you know, if they saw a crow or whatever in the distance, they would just fire the gun. It wasn't at it. It was keeping their 2,000 or 3,000 or 5,000 acres clear of predators. And they were there all day, all day. Wow. Defending their territories. I didn't plan to do a book, but by the time I'd finished photographing and then I got into using remote triggers to take pictures uh you know i'd put i'd put the camera out in front of the butt and use remote triggers to get these cool pictures of the grouse coming onto the gun and i could photograph the gun and the grouse would go over the camera and all that kind of stuff which is all in the book as a photographer i like telling stories i you know i like you know it's nice to show a picture on instagram but what i actually like more is to tell a story yeah I mean, that book's well sold out now, but, you know, it's pictures of the pub and people in the pub. And, you know, it tells the whole story through winter, spring and 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 obviously summer and, and, and autumn into the shooting. But what it's really about is the relationship between the hills and, and the people and how they rely on each other without blowing my own trumpet. I didn't think it at the time, but I took some pretty amazing pictures of grouse in flight and I haven't really seen many people get anything similar to what's in the book, even to this day. And through luck, again, no intention, people started wanting to buy them and I started printing them on Hanamula paper and and all sorts of things. And I was able to, to fund, you know, improving my equipment, et cetera, et cetera, through that period but i didn't set out to do any of it because you know i'm not i'm not some serious pro photographer i just kind of guess and i've got lucky to be honest so that came out in 2015 i think we did 2000 copies including a limited edition and that was gone by christmas so then we printed another 1200 copies in 2016 that was gone by christmas and then the publisher wouldn't print anymore because he said he didn't want to store them so that's why i mean some of those books are now on ebay for a thousand quid what was a 35 quid book because they become yeah they become real collector's items i i live in the cotswolds and and one of my neighbors george who i think you're gonna have on podcast at some stage he began his partridge project and i knew they were wild birds but my god it was a whole different ball game i didn't know whether i could achieve a book to be honest because you could see them in your binoculars, but getting close to grey partridge yeah. is really hard, really hard. So I spent you know, much of 2019, 2020 
driving around these lanes just trying to understand greys and how they move and what time of day they move and you know i'd put a hide up here and there and and basically end up just sitting there like a lemon with nothing happening but you know slowly i began to to get to grips with it and i i eventually found this extraordinary place where i ended up actually digging a little pond and, and it's a very unique place and I hadn't really thought about how unique it was until I was started writing the book, which I've now done. It, it, it is a nodal point of three mature hedges and one beetle bank. So the greys and everything are using these hedges and beetle banks as highways. And this all brings them in. And there's a track there, which is very, very fine dust, which they love to, to dust bathe in. And um, the hares come by. There's a yellow hammer community. There's a linnet community there, et cetera, et cetera. And what's amazing about it is the sun comes up to my right and goes down to my left. So I can get perfect morning light in the morning and perfect evening light in the evening. And then I put this pond in just to kind of see what happened. And the first year it was the greys came and everybody told me they wouldn't because they don't need water, which I, I concur with because not every grey came. But then last year in the drought, it was absolutely, it was like Heathrow Airport. Really? I mean, the biggest night, nine coveys came in about the space of an hour. Really? And And what's interesting, I mean, I, I've, you know, these birds make a noise. Unless, unless you are sitting and hide with greys around you, you have no idea of the real noise they make talking to each other and talking to their young i can hear this sort of pop, 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 and i know they're coming i know they're about 10 meters away and even the keeper until i made him sit in the hide even george until i made them sit in the hide and 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 the greys came they had no idea they made those noises that's cool because you you don't i mean you hear them screeching and or they screech when they take off and you spook them that's one noise but when they're happy and chatting to each other there's a whole language which you can only hear when you're very close to them. So when it when it when we was thin on water, they would come in, and and there was a hierarchy, and the hierarchy was nothing to do with the number in the brood. So an eight would clearly be considered a, a stronger brood than a twelve, even though the twelve were, were more numerous. <laughs> So if the eight were at the water, nobody would push them out. They would wait. And I could see them waiting 20 yards to my right. But if the 12 was there and the eight came, the eight would just come in and go, right, get the hell out of here. We're taking over and just push them out. And that, that evening, it was crazy because I could see one lot and another lot and another lot. And then another lot would fly in and sit in the stubble. It was like Heathrow Airport with them coming in. Now, that doesn't mean that they were gasping for water but the water was there and they were using it and they were using it all day because I had trail cams on and about every hour or two, a, a, a family would come and drink. And so I, I just, I mean, I probably did 500 hours over four years in a hide with yellow hammers and greys and stuff, photographing them. Unbelievable. So when's this, when's the book coming out? Well, we're just discussing that either May or September of next year. Okay. I've written it. I photographed it. But you have to plan so far ahead to to do it. Surely you now feel pretty funny about the idea of shooting at Grey Partridge. <laughs> a lot of people ask me that. And I do, particularly when I got to know them almost personally. But I'm equally clear that once they've done their thing and once they're you know, a year or two old, they do become barren. They do become cantankerous. And, and what you end up with is a barren pair dominating prime ground and and that is why you're shooting them and i think one of george i think when you have george on one of the things he will argue is he's been successful because he was brave enough to shoot them interesting and interesting. and and the other thing is i mean you know i could tell you a million things but i mean back to yellow hammers or greys george has got you know chicory and six meter margins and wildflowers and blah 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 but he's obviously only got it on his ground. And then you go to, you know, as you leave George's ground, you return to no margins and hedges squared off, you know, five foot, five foot high, squared off, 
farm right up to the edge, etc. And you you literally cease to see yellow hammers within a hundred meters of George's ground. It just stops. It just stops. And it, it is it just you know come and have a look. It's a prime example of the difference between the, the farming practices and the managing pra- practices, etc. It's it's just so. Yeah clear there's so much i can't wait to talk to george about that because that's something i'm becoming really passionate about because it's such a massive defense of everything else that goes on and and you know i i god there's so much to talk about but i mean another cool one other cool thing that i i learned is in now if i'm in my hide and and a pair of grays come i don't know if we've got time to talk about this but um and a pair of grays come and a hare comes lolloping past the cock will go for the hare and 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 spoo- and make it go away. If a pigeon lands, the cock will go for go for a pigeon or or anything else. A- anything that comes near his his girlfriend, it'll see off. But unquestionably, a hare. Okay, move on through the breeding season. Blah blah blah. We're in September, and he's there with his family. He will welcome a hare to come and sit right in the middle of the covey. And and the hares will do that countless times and so it's a completely different reaction and i think in the in in the spring he's being protective of his girlfriend in the autumn the hare wants to sit amongst them and use their eyes because they're constantly i call it a predator check if you watch these birds for any amount of time they are constantly doing that grouse wild grays etc they're always doing that always cocking their head up looking in the sky and i think the hare is using the partridge's eyes and the partridges are using the hare's ears and that's why they're happy for them to sit right in the middle of the family that's so interesting unbelievably cool unbelievably it is. cool it is and it, so i i'm so jealous of you that you spent that amount of time sitting out there enjoying it i mean that you're going to look back on being some of the best time of your life uh, absolutely i mean look don't get me wrong i've sat there for a lot of hours looking at nothing thinking feeling yeah. like an idiot probably <laughs> listening to to guns on pegs podcasts or something but when it comes when they come you know we talk about great sporting moments and all the rest of it that's as good as any fish any grouse any pigeon it's as exciting as ever because you're just wired that these incredibly wild creatures are right in front of you and i mean banging into that you know when they're fighting when you've got uh, uh, two coveys having a fight they're banging into my hide. They're, they're, they're way too close to photograph. All I can do is just watch. And, <laughs> and, 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 and you know, I'm worried one is going to come in the hide somehow or under it or whatever. <laughs> they're knocking into the hide, screeching, fighting, except the other thing is they are such brave birds. I mean, when I'm out looking for chicks, you know, the little puffballs, which are, you know, a day or two old, if you get close, they will attack you. The parents will attack you. Really? with deafening screeching noise they're not afraid of anything or anybody they're the coolest birds they really are well that's it's 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 awesome i can't wait to see the book here here and i I want a sabbatical to just go and sit in the field and watch (laughs) great pastures (laughs) should i just remind you chris that you are the boss you could give yourself a sabbatical (laughs) I, i recommend it chris i recommend it it it's good for the soul it really is. Good I can imagine. Yeah. I'll have one if yeah. you're not going to yeah. take it. And, and, you know, <laughs> little things like yellow hammers, you don't need to get up early for yellow hammers. They're always the last to the party yeah. and they're always the first to leave. I don't know why, but they're always last in the mornings. Everyone else comes early. The yellow hammers come last. They don't like to get out of bed early and they will go to bed before everybody else. They will disappear before everybody <laughs> else. And the only t- the only way to know any of that is just because I've sat there for hours and hours yeah. and hours watching. Well, we 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 had a, a brief moment last weekend. I was standing in the sitting room and I said, "Oh my god, Flo, Flo!" to my wife, and she was like, "What? What?" And I said, "Yellow hammer." Turns out it wasn't, but it was <laughs> one of those moments. We're still <laughs> we're, we're still waiting for the first one in the garden or just in our little they, field. They bit, just but... yeah, I mean, you need to do it in the field because they don't come into the garden. They yeah, just it, don't... we've got a bit of field and garden just sort of on the edge, and I, I I've been watching them because where I see them on the walk, it's farmland. There's a lot of field just left. It's not in yeah. crop. Uh, this year and I've seen them in the hedgerows and they and we get the local village wildlife people out and they they capture and ring and all sorts of stuff yeah. and 
Yeah, it's getting quite exciting. But I mean, can you put a feeder with millet? Yeah. Well, put a feeder with millet and and put, throw a bit of millet. And if they're down the hedge, they will work their way along the hedge. They work okay. their way up and down the hedge. But what you've got to be careful of, yeah. which we haven't talked about, is, and I had to be very careful of this with my whole pond, and you've got to be careful you don't turn it into a predator feeding station. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, so, you know, where you position things, you've got to make sure that there's cover and they, they've got a quick dart to cover, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, it becomes a predator feeding station as well. Good. So, so the hedges that they're on don't quite connect to ours, but I reckon that they they must have gone over because I know that uh, the the village wildlife people have sort of mapped them and they see them either side of the village. We're on the edge right. of the village, out on one side, so they must come over. Yeah, but yeah, well, fascinating talking about it. Really, yeah. it's really, very cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, look, the way we end these podcasts, as you you know very well, is with desert island shooting. So Tarquin. One last day, where would it be? Who are you having with you? Don't forget, money's no object. Time is not an issue. What are you doing? God, that's a difficult one. Um, and people ask me that all the time. And I often say my answer's often the last thing I did because I'm most enthusiastic about it because I've just done it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's so um, shooting. I say that throughout the season. You know, when you get to the partridge season, I was like, do you know what? Oh, that's yeah. actually, it doesn't get any better than that. And then obviously by the end of the year, it changes. And yeah. But I mean, I've actually got a different, a slightly different take. I, I think the best, the best sporting moments are actually the anticipation. Yeah. Ooh, I like where this is going. You know, if you think of when you get into a grouse butt, how good it feels to get into a grouse butt, <laughs> yeah. knowing that grouse are going to come. Or getting into an alter boat. An alter boat is, is the canoes on the alter, which is the, the most famous Atlantic salmon river in the world for huge fish. And you know, they're beautiful wooden Karis Jock canoes. And, and to get in an alter boat to know you've got a knight on the alter. There's no, there's no better feeling, and I, I, I actually think, and and the same with me coming back to talking about the the greys. You know, get it. I, I love to get in my hide because I just don't know what's going to show up or what's going to happen. This whole thing is so important because I think this is the reason I love the night before shooting yeah. so much better than staying the night after. It's nothing to do with the wine. No, it's not. George. As, <laughs> I, I know that's the simple view, and it would be very accurate. But uh, it's the anticipation that just makes you enjoy the whole thing so much more. Yeah, that's right. But I mean, if I had to do a day, and and I've chosen, I've chosen, uh, I've chosen shooting because we are a, a shooting uh, podcast. But it would have to be a day in a pigeon hide with my dog or dogs. But it would have to be that I had reconned it myself. Yeah. That I had decided where the hide should be. That I'd built it all. That I'd done it all myself. Uh, I'm not into somebody doing it for you because most of the skill is in actually the observation and the preparation and mm. you know making sure you're not shooting at your source and all those all those th sorts of things. And then the most magical part of the day i mean it's fantastic when you realize it's working mm. yeah and you think okay this is actually working because you know we all know how often it doesn't work yeah 15 years ago for me <laughs> <laughs> but when they suddenly start coming it's like wow this is cool this is working but the best part of the day actually is the sun's going down it's a beautiful sunny evening and you're sweeping with your dog and, you know, there's a few that have gone in the wood and there's a few that have gone over there and you just sweep it for like an hour with your dog and you find the odd bird and the sun's going down. It's a beautiful evening like this time of year if it's warm up. Those moments, I think, are pretty special. Although I'm a bit of a loner, it is fun to share it with a friend, but they've got to be dialed into the yeah. magnificence of the occasion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And there must be no pressure to get them birds or get them shooting, or it's got to be a proper friend who totally gets it. Yeah. And it, you know, if I was gonna do fishing, I know I've been completely spoiled on fishing. I would. There's a river in the northeast of Iceland called the Sella, which is unquestionably the best river in Iceland. 
for every reason. Interesting water, variation of fish, amazing pools. It's challenging. You know, you can be the best fisherman in the world, but it can burn you. And I like that that sense that you can you can fish a pool full of fish but catch nothing because you just got burnt because they just flick two bit, two fingers at you. I like the edge edginess of failure when success is sitting right in front of you. So those would be probably my choices, I think. That's really lovely. Oh. And I've got to say, I love the phrase, the edginess of failure when success is in front of you. I love that sums up <laughs> salmon fishing so beautifully. I just love that. <laughs> what a wonderful phrase. I think I'm going to get that on a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I love doing this on a Friday evening, George. We've got to do this more often because that whole... Uh, way you were describing sitting in the pigeon hide whatever i'm not even going to do any recon i'm just going to go to the the corner of the field tomorrow (laughs) with the dog i'm going to sit there for a little bit and i'm just going to enjoy it for a few minutes i might see one pigeon who cares but it's that moment and and it's because it's friday evening i can do that tomorrow (laughs) exactly the reason i like doing it on a friday evening because i've had half a bottle of whiskey it's been great (laughs) (laughs) george you know where the save button is for a podcast now do you i don't need to save it does it all automatically it's fine um, <laughs> God for that. um but no Tarquin thank you so much for joining us and at short notice so it's been really good fun and I've loved listening to you talk yeah brilliant thanks Tarquin awesome well thank you guys it's been great have a good weekend it started well um <laughs> So, as per usual, there is one final reminder that you can get your hands on a pair of the very exclusive Guns on Pegs podcast shooting sock garters by sending us your shooting dilemmas for us to resolve, by sending us your unpopular opinions, or sharing your forgotten drives with us. Just drop us an email to pod at gunsonpegs.com, and if we read it out in the next episode or any future episode, we will send you some garters, or our friend will send you some garters. We will be back (laughs) in a couple of weeks, but until then... Thanks very much for listening and goodbye.